Hey, good morning, and welcome to our Palm Sunday service. These are indeed unique times uh, as I stare out at an empty uh, sanctuary here. And so I know that some of us are missing greatly gathering together with family and with our church family as well. And in light of that fact, um, my wife and I were sharing this week and we found a liturgy entitled A Liturgy for Missing Someone. And we'd like to share that with you. Indeed, we'd like to invite you to participate with us. Um, I will read the lighter print and you all at home and our worship team here is going to read responsibly the darker print. So let's do that. Let's kind of get our hearts uh, in, in a mode of prayer here before the Lord as we worship. A liturgy for missing someone. We willingly carry this ache. We carry it, O oh Father, to you. You created our hearts for unbroken fellowship. Yet the constraints of time and place and the stuttering rhythms of life in a fallen world dictate that all fellowships in these days will at times be broken or incomplete. And so we find ourselves in this season bearing the sorrow of our separation. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that it is a right and a good thing to miss deeply those whom we love, but with whom we cannot be physically present. Grant us, therefore, courage to love well, even in this time of absence. Grant us courage to shrink neither from the aches nor from the joys that love brings. For each willingly received will accomplish the good works you have appointed them to do. Therefore, we praise you, even for our sadness, knowing that the sorrows we steward in this life will in time be redeemed. We praise you also, knowing that these glad aches are a true measure of the bonds you have wrought between our hearts. Now, now use our sorrows as tools in your hand, O Lord, shaping our hearts into a truer imitation of the affections of Christ. Use even this sadness to carve out spaces in our souls where still greater repositories of holy affection might be held. Unto the end that we might better love in times of absence and in times of presence alike. We now entrust all to your keeping. May our reunion be joyous, whether in this life or in the life to come. How we look forward, O oh Lord, to the day when all our fellowships will be restored, eternal and unbroken. Amen. Amen. That was taken from Every Moment Holy by Douglas McKelvey. Before, just before we bust the book, I got just a couple announcements for you. Of course, there aren't too many, but we are going to have a Good Friday community service online, as similar to what we're doing here today. And that's going to be Good Friday, this Friday at 1 o'clock. So if you'll tune in at that time, uh, we'll have representation. It's a community service with New Haven, United Church of the Brethren, and here, we here at MRCCC. Also, today being Palm Sunday, this is the first day of our reading plan for the Easter week. Uh, that plan is called the Path to the Cross. You can get a hold of that uh, reading outline online, or there are physical copies of that here at the church. If you stop by, you can pick one up. Uh, with that in mind, and uh, with that being said, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to, going to uh, look into God's Word this morning. Let's do that. Father in heaven, we come before you in this time. It's uh, a strange and unique time. Uh, we've never experienced anything like this before, and uh, it feels kind of uncertain and unreal almost. Uh, and yet we acknowledge when we look back at the history of man, uh, this really 
pales in light of the pain and suffering that many cultures all over this world experience. And yet it's hard, Lord. People are sick and they're dying. And we just don't know what the future holds, neither from a physical standpoint nor from a leadership, governmental standpoint, um, financial standpoint. Many are hurting financially now during this time. All of a sudden, we went from prosperity to lack. And yet, we are reminded, Lord, that you don't change and that you provide and that you can be trusted. And you love us. You care for us. Invite us to cast our, all our cares on you. So, Lord, we just come before you uh, with hurting hearts and with, uh, in some cases, with fear, with a little bit of concern, with worry. Uh, and we just cast those cares upon your throne of grace. I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the lives of those who have humbled themselves and received the free gift of eternal life in Christ. And I pray that you would just continue to use times like this to, to draw us near to Christ, to learn more of him, and to increase our faith so that we can better be representatives and ambassadors of Jesus Christ in this world. Father, we're going to uh, get into your word right now and I just pray that you would just remove me out of this equation and give deep insight, give a, ability to attend to this word. This is such a, a marvelous picture that you paint for us in the Word. And in light of, of what we're experiencing in our lives, we just need to hear from you. And, and I pray that uh, this would be more than just the content of these words, but it would be the dynamic, the power of your Holy Spirit just kind of reaching out and touching our hearts and our minds. I pray if any who hear this word have yet to, to just trust in Christ, to give them their life, I pray that today might be that day and that you would dynamically move in and change the course, the direction, and the destiny of people's lives because of the power of your word and your great love and grace toward them in Christ Jesus. So do that, Lord. Only you can. Only you can. Use your word to do it again, Lord, as you've done in my life and in so many lives. Do it today in Jesus' name. Amen. A few short weeks ago, life in America was kind of about pleasure and prosperity. We may not have said that. We were just living life by the day. And life was good. Suddenly, it's about pain and poverty. People are afraid. They're concerned. Many are sick. Many are dying. An unseen contagion is wrecking our wealth and our world. And none of us have seen anything like this before. And we really never anticipated that we would. This is our, our current event. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, we had a class called Current Events, and we would gather in that class and get our newspapers out, and we would discuss the events of that day or the events of the past week. Well, this is now our current event. And I wonder sometimes, what does God think of COVID-19, and where is he in all of this? To answer that question, we go to the place above all that reveals God to us, and we go to the person that is Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. We go to Jesus. And I wonder if there is any place in Scripture that can help us see God during these uncertain times. <laughs> yes, there is. 
There are so many places in Scripture that God speaks into our pain and purpose, this one included. And I want to I start this message today. I want to share just a couple of passages that, that come to mind uh, in light of this current event. The first one is Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, where Jesus is talking here and he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. And I read that and I wonder, why not? And then he answers the question. He goes on to say, because moth and rust destroy earthly treasures and thieves can break in and steal them. So Jesus says worldly treasure, it just doesn't last. There's no certainty there. There's no security. They're not eternal. Now the scriptures are really clear that you, you and I are eternal. And so Jesus is saying, don't waste your time, your life, your effort, your soul there on earthly things. It's a dead-end street. And folks, if you live your earthly life and all you have is earthly treasures, you have nothing in the end. And I think, I think we might be more apt to wake up and see the truth of Jesus' words now in light of what we're experiencing Jesus goes on in verse 20 to say the opposite. He says, but instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now why? And he gives the answer, because moth and rust do not destroy there, and thieves cannot break in and steal. Now folks, at this point, I have to level a caution. Don't think of heaven as the place where you get everything you wanted on earth to the max. I've done a lot of, of funerals and, and memorial services, and I hear this a lot. You know, uh, a, a guy that passed is loved to golf, and, and so it's like you know, I hear people say, well, he's going on to that better place where, where that beautiful golf course in the sky where the sand traps you know, are filled with gold dust and things like that, or, or better yet, there aren't any sand traps at all. Or I hear of a person who loved to camp, you know, and so he's off to that great campground in the sky. And I say to you about that now, it is, it is way better than our earthly desires and pursuits. Heaven is the place where God is. Heaven is the place where we will fulfill our greatest desire and our greatest purpose, which is to relate in perfect, sinless love and intimacy with the most beautiful, the most loving, the most holy, the most powerful creator, God. And we will also relate the same with one another. So, so Jesus says, don't make life about earthly treasures because they don't last. Make your life about heavenly treasures. They do last eternally. But then Jesus says, what I think is the most important thing in the very next verse, verse 21, he says, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, words, folks, what you treasure will make you. What you treasure will form your soul. If you treasure stuff, then the pursuit of that stuff will make your soul. If you treasure Jesus, he will make your soul. Folks, the scriptures are clear that you and I are going to live eternally. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die. That's a physical death where we shed our earth suit. But after this, after our physical death, the judgment. That means we have an appointment with God, where he is going to hold us accountable for how we managed the life that we live. These few years on this earth, folks, are just the beginning of who you are and what you will become. You are eternal. What a tragedy to be all about earthly stuff and miss your eternal destiny. So here's my counsel to you. In light of this passage of scripture, it's straightforward, straight at it. Give your soul and your body 
and your life to Jesus. Give it to him. He will forgive your sin and he will live within you as his temple by his spirit and he will make you fit for eternal life, your eternal destiny. And on top of that, he will make your earthly life the best life that you could have. Not in stuff, but if you will, but if you invest only in earthly treasure, here's what happens. You lose both earth and heaven. And if you give you to Jesus, you get not only heaven, but you get earth as well in the greatest, best relational sense. You get both. So that passage is Matthew 6, 19 to 21. I said I had a couple for you. Another passage that comes to mind in light of our current events of the coronavirus is Luke chapter 13. In Luke 13, Jesus was asked about a current event. This is like the only place in the gospel where this current event that was happening at that time, somebody says, hey, Jesus, what do you think about this? Did you hear what happened? And that's exactly what Luke 13, 1 says. It says there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. You see, Pontius Pilate had slaughtered a bunch of Galilean Jews who had gathered for Passover. And those slain by Pilate, Pilate soldiers were probably followers, history tells us this, of a guy by the name of Judas Galanias. He was a Jewish man who revolted against paying tribute to Caesar and he taught others to do the same. So Pilate waited until these Galilean Jews were gathered for Passover. And then, when he had them all together, he slaughtered them. He cut them down. And their blood was mixed with the blood of the Passover lambs that were being slain. It was a terrible, vicious, heartless tragedy. A current event in Jesus' day. Now, it's not a disease like coronavirus, but... But people died. They died in an unexpected, random fashion. Much like our world is experiencing now. So they brought it to Jesus' attention. What would he have to say about that? I wonder, is he going to tell us why? Often when people go through difficult things, that's the question. Why does God allow such terrible things to happen? Or maybe he's going to tell us how those people who, who died, who were killed, were such terrible people. They were just worse people. That's why it happens. Is that what Jesus is going to say? Well, let's find out. Luke 13, 2, Jesus answered. And often Jesus leads in an answer with a question. And he does the same here. I love that about Jesus. He says, do you guys think that these Galileans who were slaughtered, were worse sinners than all the other Galileans that lived because they suffered in this way. Do you think that? I'll tell you what, folks, a lot of people in our world today think that. Verse 3, Jesus tells you what reality is. He says, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. And I'm, I'm sitting here and I read that and I think, re repent. You know, I, I want to know why my brother-in-law died so young. And you tell me to repent? What, what's that all about? Listen, this world is broken. I hear young people, I used to be a teacher and I hear them all the time talk about fairness. That's not fair, they would cry. Listen, in a world that is marred and messed up by sin and death, you will not have fairness, ever. And besides that, when you think deeply about it and when you think humbly about it, you and I don't even know what fair is. Because fairness is perfect justice. And for us to know what's perfectly just, we would have to know all things about all things for all of time. And no one knows that but God. So justice, fairness, is only his to judge and to levy. 
And since this world in its present form is not fair, and it's so uncertain and dangerous, basically Jesus says this, you know what? That that happened to those Galileans could happen to anybody. It could happen to you. So the question isn't about how good or bad the people were. Bad things happen to good people all the time in this world, and good things happen to bad people all the time as well. In other words, let me paraphrase Jesus' words this way, life on a sinful, broken planet is uncertain. So get right with God now. You know, I have heard so many people say, well, you know, I will do business with God or I will get saved or however they want to word it. I'll do that later. Or I'll do that at the end of my life. I hope you see by the end of our time today how foolish that really is. But let's answer this question. Well, how do you get right with God? Well, that's what Jesus was talking about. You repent. What is repentance? Turning from your own way. For example, the way that says, well, I'm going to wait. Turning from your own way and turning to God's way. And God's way for you is Jesus Christ. And that, folks, that right there is what we're going to see Today and in the next few weeks in, in what I believe is just a marvelous, marvelous way. So that being the introduction, and this being our current event, the series that we're on is an Easter series. It's called Commune. And basically, in this series, we're going to answer this question, where did communion come from? Where did communion come from? And when I say communion, I'm talking about the bread and the wine or juice. Where'd that come from? Today, we're just going to look at the bread, the communion bread, if you will. That's the topic. Now, if, you were, if I were to ask you where communion came from and what that's all about, many of you would mention the Last Supper. The Last Supper was eaten by Jesus the night he was betrayed. And he ate that supper with his disciples. He was arrested a little bit later. He was taken that night and put on trial before the Sanhedrin. That's the Jewish ruling council throughout that night. In the early morning, they brought him before Pontius Pilate, the same guy we talked about that, that killed all those Galilean Jews. They brought him before Pilate, and then he was crucified beginning at about 9 a.m., the next morning after the Last Supper, after the First Communion. So where did communion come from? The Last Supper is where and when Jesus instituted what we would call, in a formal sense, communion. But let me tell you something. There is oh so much more to it than that, and I, I just hope it compels you to, and to draw nearer to Christ. Let's talk about the bread that Jesus ate and broke that night with his disciples. I hope you all had a chance this week to watch my Facebook video <laughs> that introduced this communion series. It was my first cooking show. Okay. Uh, some of you watched Martha Bakes on PBS, so it was Pastor Bakes this week. And in that video, I made matzah, or at least I attempted to. Matzah is the kind of bread that Jesus ate that night. It's unleavened bread. And that means it's bread that's made without yeast. Yeast is a microorganism that we put in the dough mixture that actually feeds on the carbohydrates and the sugars that are in the bread. So the bread dough, because yeast is a part of the dough, is actually feeding on itself. Why don't you say that with me right now? Feeding on itself itself remember that because of the picture this is going to paint feeding on itself and when you are making regular bread you actually give the yeast warmth and the time 
to feed on itself, to feed on the bread. And you have to wait on the yeast to eat. It's called proving the bread or letting the bread rise. And as the yeast in the dough eats the carbohydrates, it produces as a byproduct carbon dioxide gas bubbles that puff up the bread. They puff it up. Now, matzah is bread that's made without yeast. So there are no bubbles, there's no puffing up, there's no puffy texture. Matzah comes out of the oven sort of flat, almost like a cracker. And there's a picture there on the screen of what it, what it looks like. Now, why? Why did Jesus eat matzah, unleavened bread, at the Last Supper? Why did he use that as the communion bread? Well, it goes way, way back, historically. And we're going to get into some of that next week, the history of it. But for this week, we just want to finish asking why unleavened bread? Why was that so important? Because let me tell you something. It was really important to Jesus because it's really important for you and I to understand this. Here's why. Here's why. Yeast and the effect that yeast has on bread dough is symbolic in the scriptures. It symbolizes the effect that sin has on the dough of your life. Yeast symbolizes sin. Say that with me. You ready? Yeast symbolizes sin. Let me show you. When you, when you read the scriptures all through the Old Testament, about eating unleavened bread for a lot of the festivals that the, the Old Testament, Old Covenant Jews had. But it doesn't say a whole lot about what that represents. But in the New Testament, I give you 1 Corinthians 5, 6. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And he says, and remember this, he symbolizes sin. He says, you're boasting. Remember we talked about yeast puffing up the bread. Being puffed up is sometimes a sin. Uh, the way we would describe a prideful person. And Paul says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, but the yeast the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Now, there's a lot in that passage, but for now, do you see that yeast pictures sin? What, what yeast does, the bread dough, and all that action and activity is a picture of sin. Yeast acts like sin in our lives. Sin eats your soul on the inside. It consumes. It works through the whole batch of your life, and it puffs up. That's why earlier I described a person who would say, well, you know, I will do business with God later in my life. It doesn't work that way. Because to prefer uh, the pleasures of sin, that sin is working in and on you. It's literally eating your soul. There's no guarantee if you put Jesus off, that later you will even want anything ever to do with him because of the effect of sin on your heart. It puffs us up. It makes us foolish, arrogant, prideful. Sin makes us think, here, check this one out. It makes us think, hey, this is my life, and I will do with it what I want. See, that is not only foolish and prideful, it's also just flat out wrong. It's a lie. Because the reality is, your life, your soul, is not your own. You didn't create it, and you don't own it. Your life, your body, your soul was a gift to you from God. 
He made it, and you are his. And the reality is, he expects you to manage what he has given you for him and for his glory, because that's what you were designed for, and in that is your flourishing and your joy. That's the truth. And when your life is over and your earth suit wears out, I already mentioned this verse in Hebrews 9, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. There's an appointment that each of us has with God to give an accounting of what we did with the life he gave us. And the judgment is God saying, okay, let's take a look. Let's take a look at the life that I created and gave to you to manage, and let's see how you managed it. Every one of us has an appointment with God to give an account of your life. And, and now let me, let me tell you how I think that my appointment with God is going to go, based on the truth of God's Word. We'll start with God. So my earth suit's done, and I'm standing before God at my appointment. And God says, well, Jerry, let's, let's take a look. What did you do with the life I gave to you? And once God gives me the strength to get back up on my feet before him, I'm going to say something like this. God, I gave my life to Jesus. I gave my body as a temple for your Holy Spirit to live in. I failed a lot in my flesh, but your spirit did a lot in me and through me by your grace. That's what I did with the life you gave to me. I gave it to Jesus. And God's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Listen to me. The only thing that you and I can do with our lives to please God, the only thing is to give it to Jesus. I know a lot of people that think, well, it's about how you treat people. and Well, you got to do this and you, you, you can't ever do that. And it's just about how you live your life. Well, here's the problem with that. The yeast thing is we all have the yeast thing going on. And doing better in your life or treating people right doesn't deal with that. Only Jesus can deal with that problem. And so I'll say it again, the only thing you and I can do with our lives to please God is to give it to Christ. So yeast is a picture. It's a picture of sin. Let, let me help you out with that because that, that term is kind of old and worn out and, and made fun of. Think of it this way. Let's think of sin as an acronym, S-I-N. The S stands for separated. Say separated. Separated. Separated from God. S stands for sin separates us from God. The I stands for inside. That's where the problem is in our soul. Sin gets inside us like, e like yeast. It's a part of the dough. It's not separate from the dough. It's the dough consuming itself. That's what sin does. It's inside us and it consumes our life. It eats our soul from the inside out. It consumes us. And then the N. The N stands for nothing. Say nothing. Nothing. Which means, what, what I'm trying to say there is it results in emptiness or nothingness. It results in your soul having no meaning, no purpose, no worth at the end of it all. So separated, inside, and nothing. So unleavened bread. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. Unleavened bread. Bread made without yeast is a picture of a life without sin. Without sin and its effects. Now the Bible is really clear because it says in Romans 3.23 that 
All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. All have. So we all have the yeast problem going on. Now, if that's the case, if all have sinned, and if unleavened bread is a picture of life without sin, then unleavened bread is a, is a symbol of whom? Or of, of what? It's not a symbol of me. That's for sure. I'm messed up in and of myself. I have, I have broken, and I have went through and checked this out many times, and have shared it many times, that I have broken every one of God's commandments in some way of his Ten Commandments and in some form during my life. And I'll bet that unleavened bread is not a symbol of you in your life as well. I'll bet you that you would not argue that you are perfect. Well then, obviously, whose life does unleavened bread represent? A life without sin. Unleavened bread, bread made without yeast, represents the life of Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of Jesus in John 6, 48 through 51. John chapter 6, one of my favorite chapters. Here's what Jesus said in verse 48. He said, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that, that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. It doesn't get any clearer than that. He says, this is who I am. I am that living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, eternal life. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He's talking about his death, his crucifixion. This bread is my flesh, which I will get for the life of the world. So, on that night, First Communion, Jesus took the unleavened matzah bread, and he gave it to his disciples at the Last Supper. Now, what did the disciples do with it? They ate it. They took it. They received it. And when they received and ate that bread, what did their eating symbolize? That symbolic bread being eaten symbolized them taking the sinless life of Christ into their being, receiving it. Have you done that? I'm not talking about eating communion bread. I'm not talking about taking communion. I'm talking about the real thing, not the symbol. I'm talking about receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior sent from God for you. I'm talking about John 1, 12. Yet to all who received him, to those, how do you receive him? To those who believed in his name. What's Jesus' name? Well, you say it's Jesus. It's Yeshua in the language of the day. And Yeshua literally means that God saves. When you believe on the name of Jesus, you quit trusting in yourself to save yourself. You trust in God who saves. And how does God save? Through his son, sending his son through the cross and the resurrection. He did that for you and I because he loved us. And to those who believe in his name that God saves, he gives the right to become his children, children of God. What a symbol. Look, as we close here today, there's one other thing that unleavened bread symbolizes that I really need to point out, because this is a big part of it. Remember how I said that yeast needs time to rise, to prove the bread. It takes time. That's why we give bread time to prove or to rise, because it takes time for that yeast to eat it and to puff it up. 
Now, since unleavened bread has no yeast and it doesn't need time to rise, you can, you can mix the dough of unleavened bread. You can bake it right away. And for this reason, the, time, the, the idea that it takes no time to make unleavened bread, unleavened bread is therefore a symbol of haste, of doing something in a hurry, of getting it done right now. Deuteronomy 16.3 points this out. Moses writes, don't eat it, the lamb, with bread made with yeast. Don't do that. But for seven days, eat unleavened bread. And then he describes it, the bread of affliction, because you left Egypt in haste. They left in a hurry. They left in haste. That's why they ate unleavened bread. Because you can make it in a hurry without waiting. It symbolized that. Now, remembering that yeast is a symbol of sin, remembering that unleavened bread is symbolic of, of Jesus Christ's sinless life, remembering that eating unleavened bread is also symbolic of receiving Jesus' sinless life as your own, as your own Savior. How does this being in a hurry symbol add into all that? And it's simply this. If you have yet to receive Christ, what are you waiting for? You take this bread, the bread of Jesus' sinless life, you receive it, you believe on his name, it's been given to you. You take that in a hurry. You run to Jesus. Anything else is an insult to God who sacrificed his own son for you. You do it now. And you say, well, I'm going to think about it. Well, I'm going to put it off till my deathbed. Then I'll get right with God. Do you see that that idea in and of itself is the yeast consuming your very soul. Because God commands you to do quite the opposite. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. He says, For God says this, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Let me just kind of summarize what we've, what we've seen here today, and we'll close today. Thank you, by the way, for tuning in. Uh, I hope that your eyes were open to some things that, that maybe you just hadn't seen before that will, if you're a believer, draw you nearer to Christ, make you love and appreciate Him more. And if you are still considering Christ, that it would, it would compel you to once and for all surrender your life to him. Let's summarize. Unleavened bread was the bread that Jesus ate for communion the night of the Last Supper. It was matzah. Yeast in normal bread is a symbol of sin. It consumes. It consumes itself. It multiplies. It, it puffs up the bread. Unleavened bread is symbolic of a life without sin. It's symbolic, therefore, of Jesus Christ. Unleavened bread is also symbolic of haste, meaning you come to Jesus in a hurry because he is the best thing that could ever happen to you. Folks, listen, if you've learned anything from this coronavirus thing that has happened to us all, I'll bet that you've learned anew of the frailty and uncertainty of life. Let me ask you this. This is our current event. Do you think that those who have died from coronavirus are somehow worse sinners? than you and I. 
remember Jesus words I tell you now but unless you repent you too will all perish folks the stuff we love and enjoy in this planet is so uncertain give your life to Jesus Christ after all, Easter is when we celebrate the fact that Jesus gave his life for you. Give your life to him. Do it now. Do it in a hurry. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this symbol. Sin separates us from you. It separates us from each other. It hurts people. And it also is inside us, just like the yeast is a part of the dough that it's eating. Sin is a part of our soul that's eating our soul. And it results in nothing. S-I-N, nothing. A life that you created that was for eternity, eternal purpose, eternal meaning, eternal love results in worthless nothing because of sin. And yet, Lord, you did something about that. And we thank you. That's what Easter's about. Jesus coming down here. He knew what was going to happen to him. And he went willingly. And he prayed for the forgiveness of even the people who were torturing him. What a life. The only unleavened bread that there ever had been since Adam. And Father, we are in desperate need of a relationship with you, every single one of us. People may be listening to me that don't even believe you exist. I guess it really doesn't matter if they believe in you because I know you believe in them. And I'm asking that you would uh, somehow make known to them that you're there, that you love them, and what you did for them. They know what you did for them, I think, if they listened at all today. And there'll be more on it next week. But help them, Lord, give them the courage to face the truth. Because it's so much easier for us to run away and hide. So much easier. The truth is so hard to face for us weak, sinful people. And so I'm asking that in your grace you would give, you would author and finish faith in the hearts of those that need to know you that are, that are hearing this. Father, only you can save them. They can't save themselves. No human being can give their life for another human being for the purpose of eternal life. We can, we can sacrifice ourselves for another person's physical life and many are are doing that even now as healthcare workers all over the place are taking care of people who are sick with this thing and putting their own lives at risk. They are sacrificing their own safety and security for the good of another person. And that is, that is noble and it is good. And it's so much like Jesus. But, but even if they gave their life for another, they might save their physical life, but their eternity can only be saved by you. And so, Father, I just pray that you would do all, what only you can do. Take this word, apply it to their heart, grant them the faith to believe it, and to courageously stand up and say, April 6th, 2020, right in the midst of that COVID-19 coronavirus thing is the day that I came to life, that I asked Jesus, the life of Jesus, given for me to be my own. I surrendered my life to him. Father, give him the courage to believe it, to say it, to rejoice in it, because this is good news. May they hurry. May they hurry to you. May they run to you once and for all. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
invite you back uh, next week, this week, our communion series was the bread. Next week, we're going to look at my body. So it's still on the bread, but we're going to do a little bit of the history and look back at the Jewish history to see where this whole thing came from. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be beautiful. So I, we'd invite you back. Uh, John chapter 6 in verse 35 is the benediction today. Uh, bear with me while I find that. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. We believe you, Lord Jesus. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.